my sister loves to tell this story, and she's seven years older than I am, that she remembers me taking off from our house, running down the street uh, to my friend's house, yelling at the top of my lungs, fast as the wind, and then splat, falling flat on my face. Now, I have no doubt that that probably happened, but do I have a memory of falling flat on my face and my sister laughing at me about it? No. Wendy Dutton is a forensic interviewer. In criminal investigations, she's called on to question children about what they do and don't remember, to get them to tell their stories without tainting their memories. Forensic interviewing is basically taking what we know from the literature on children's memory, eyewitness ability, and linguistics, and using that science to structure an interview protocol so that children can hopefully provide as much accurate information about something they saw or experienced. So asking a question like, tell me everything that happened, again is inviting the information to come from the child. I'm not asking option posing questions like yes, no questions, did it happen inside or outside your house, those kinds of things. It's coming from the child. From the words she uses to the layout of the room, Dutton controls everything about the interview so as not to alter the children's stories. It's all based on the principles of memory, but researchers have only recently begun to understand what memory is and how it works. The point of memory is to acquire information so that we can behave more efficiently in the future. That's what we now understand memory to be mostly about. It's quite useful for like telling stories about the good old times, but mostly memory is, gosh, the last time I was in this situation, uh, here's how I behaved, and it worked or it didn't work very well, so here's what I'm going to do this time. Because they're geared for survival, not accuracy, memories can get lost or changed. Memory is not a, a recollection, not a repeating of the past, it's a reconstruction of the past. We, we have sort of bits of information. Uh, some aspects of what happened and then we construct like the most likely scenario of what did happen and you know by and large it's correct uh, but sometimes it's not so correct and that's where the problems arise once you admit that that's the case and once science shows us that that's the case now you suddenly have to ask questions well what is truth what counts as truth and and in a courtroom when somebody says I absolutely remember that this is the way things happened can we believe that that's the truth? Paul Simpson has been considering these questions for decades. In my role as a forensic psychologist, I evaluate a lot of criminal cases, uh, a lot of uh, alleged sex crimes, uh, murder-related issues, and other kinds of uh, issues of violence. So on a very regular basis, the question of memory of an eyewitness um, is central to the nature of the allegations and, and the court proceedings. Simpson has seen firsthand how fragile memory can be. You know, one of the things we saw in the child abuse hysteria of the 1980s into the 1990s, we had uh, McMartin, we had Wendy Martin trial, we had um, the uh, Akiki trial, where these famous kind of child abuse uh, cases where children were making outlandish claims about uh, being abused, ritually abused. Chuck Norris was coming in to the daycare center and abusing children. And we had elephants and giraffes and zebras that were being sacrificed. In fact, that had not occurred. What had occurred, what we now find in retrospect and the, the research that's been done is we had well-intentioned but very zealous therapists doing interviews with kids and creating what we call, what we call contamination. Several controversial studies have shown that stress, the passage of time, and even how a person is asked about a memory can reshape or contaminate it. The controversial nature of these findings was that they really called into question sort of some fundamental assumptions that we make in society, in, in particular in the legal system, but not only there, you know, that are based on, you know, somewhat suspect understanding of the way the brain works. Despite the controversy, the research has changed how the legal system uses memory. When I first started in the office, which was almost four decades ago, 
it was very arguable in, in our profession to be able to say, you know, what people talk about is accurate. It's completely accurate. You need to totally trust it. And that has shifted because science has shown us that memory is not infallible, um, that there are errors and there are distortions. And that's why, as prosecutors, one of the things that we want to be able to do is to present the, the shoe impression or the tire impression or the DNA or the latent fingerprint or some other forensic evidence that ties the perpetrator to the crime. Although the legal system is catching up with the science of memory, the rest of us are a little further behind. Our memories are dear to us. They're a central part of who we are, our sense of self. Uh, and so the memories that we have of family events, the memories that we have of childhood, of uh, events that have occurred, good and bad, are very much integral to who we are, to how we see ourselves. And so. When you get a scientist poking around and saying, well, your memories may not be quite as uh, accurate uh, as you think they are, that gets personal. But the, the reality is for all of us, when you sit down with family members, when you sit down with folks and go over previous events, the amount of discrepancy is significant. And that's the case for all of us. Uh, so you gotta say, mm, somebody's gotta be wrong on this. And science says, yeah, we're actually all wrong on this to some, some degree, to some extent.